my name is Ahmed Alfi. I'm a PhD student at the Chemical Engineering Department of Moscow, and my main research topic is about algae, the anti-algae strains of the United Arab Emirates. Great. And are, are you from uh, Abu Dhabi? Yes, or? I'm from yeah. Abu Dhabi. Lab, our lab is the Microbial Environmental Chemical Engineering Lab. Uh, here we have four professors working at the same lab, temporary until we move to the next building. Then we have a bit bigger space. Uh, uh, our lab works in uh, four main projects. The first project is algal biofuels. The second project is about biogas production. The third project is about uh, camel gut microbe uh, community. And the fourth project is about ballast water uh, uh, treatment. My, my name is Ahmed Harvey. I'm a PhD student at the Chemical Engineering Program. My main research is on microalgae strains, uh, mainly about native strains that we get from the environment. Uh, when we talk about native strains and algae, you will go directly and think about the sea. But for us, we, uh, we get these microbes from the desert. Why we look in the desert? Because in the desert, we have these small pools of water with uh, limited uh, amounts of water inside. The temperature changes uh, very dramatically between summer and winter, between day and night. And uh, you will have different salinities. For example, one bowl is going to have a very saline conditions, other bowl next to it will have a very dilute uh, kind of salinity. So you have extreme conditions in the desert where you will find uh, algae that already can be uh, representing some. So uh, what we are doing here is, uh, uh, for my work, is mainly about microalgae, uh, native strains of microalgae. Where we gather the, we go and look in the desert for microalgae because in the desert we find some extreme conditions that like algae. Uh, grows in these extreme conditions, and uh, when we get this al these types of algae, will have uh, more potential for it in uh, biofuel bio uh, applications and, and, and any other applications. We find algae growing in, uh, in very high uh, salinity conditions or very uh, nutrition limited uh, conditions, and you will have some uh, of the novel and some of the uh, really. Uh, really rare uh, metabolic pathways that are happening there and they are utilizing all of the nutrients at, to, the, to the fullest potential. And these tubes, these are our photoreactors. We are growing them here at, at ambient conditions, ambient, ambient temperature with, uh, with the ambient air. When we grow them, we, we grow them under a normal cycle. This, these five tubes contain the same strain, the strain that we get from the desert. And uh, these the five tubes uh, with the the same strain and different salinities. For example, here we go from the salinity of the, of the Arabian Gulf up to 10 times that salinity. So we have a broad range of salinities where algae is growing at all of these salinities. Uh, uh, of course, the, the growth is different between one salinity to the another. But the, what, what we see in the literature, not many strains grow in this broad range of salinities. And also this uh, algae strain at certain conditions will start to produce a secondary metabolite, a chemical molecule that it releases into the growth media, a certain uh, salinities and certain uh, CO2 concentration. What that means for us is that this molecule, if it has some application, we can co-produce uh, this metabolite or this chemical with the, with the algae for uh, biofuel production or for uh, aquaculture feed or for any other uses. We use it for a variety of different things. And if you go want to go down the fuel route, you know, there is the cell wall, the lipids that you can make biodiesel, there is sometimes the sugar that the algae makes, so you can bioprocess that into drop-in jet fuel. There's a couple of companies out there that I'm working on commercializing that. Um, so now you look at two components that you can use for energy. But if you start to think about pharmaceuticals, I think Ahmed told you a little bit about the secondary metabolites that this algae is making. If you think about cosmetics, there's that other aspect of it. But straight up, if you think about cleaning water and making food, you know, if you look at aquaculture, if you look at husbandry and animal farming, um, for animal farming, we're substituting their food with rice and corn. Okay, for aquaculture, we're using kind of fish gruel or fish waste parts to feed fish. So that kind of becomes a self-defeating cycle. Um, at least for aquaculture, which is a lot of interest, it's the fastest growing food production system in the world, um, algae provides the same amount of nutrients for amino acid wise and, and other types of small molecule wise of vitamins, antioxidants that the fish need um, or shrimp need or krill need um, than the fish school that they have. And there's work that's been done with the U.S. Department of Agriculture um, that substantiates this work with the algae. So there's there's kind of different paths depending on what you want to do, and they're not independent of each other, which is the nice thing about it. Um, 
we can grow a lot of biomass using algae. We're not limited or we're not hindered by some of the problems that we have with lignocellulose-based biomass degradation. It takes a lot of energy to release the sugars in that for fermentation and for other um, processes that you use. So that's why we believe that algae is kind of, you know, an interesting way to try to address these issues. And having the type of strain that we have where you don't have to use fresh water, you don't have to worry so much about evaporation in large-scale ponds, um, particularly in places where it would be advantageous to grow algae, a.k.a. Um, the whole desert belt that goes through Mexico, through Africa, through here, through India, through China. All right? um, one of the limiting factors, and these are the fastest growing population places in the world, is water. So if you can use, grow something that then you can use for food that doesn't rely on water, okay, that can take the energy directly out of the sun, you can use it for energy so you stop bringing uh, carbon-based molecules out of the ground, you're actually making them above ground because we're not going to change our infrastructure. I don't care what anybody says in the next 100 years. There's too much money involved. The idea is how can we modify what we have and how can we do nature to actually start closing the loop all right, so that the energy we consume actually comes out of what's already out here instead of kind of like a one-way street that we're doing right now with coal, gas, and petroleum products. Plus, there's going to be a lot more expensive products that we need the petroleum for um, then burning it up in your car, like plastics, like medicine, um, other things that where the petroleum-based products are a much higher value commodity. And we will need them because when we run out, then we'll really be in trouble. So, uh, for water purification, you... compounds that are put down the commode or put down the sink, that a lot of these drugs end up in estuaries. So the fish get affected. We get affected by drinking uh, these compounds that are put out there. Um, so is anybody looking how algae can maybe degrade some of these compounds? And the answer is yes. Okay, but that type of research is in its infancy. Um, most of the algae research has been done in the past 50, 60 years is basically for bowel food. I mean, there was a huge push for algae research in World War II because the petroleum lifelines were affected in Europe. So people, and you know, you couldn't make oil, you couldn't make lubricants. So people looked at algae to make glycerol, people looked at algae for biofuels, for burning. Um, and you know, algae has been used for food in China for at least 3,500 years, we have record of it. So in that sense, you know, it's also one of the only approved programs for bioremediation food um, from the UN, and the spirulina programs. Okay, and they're in Africa, they use them in Haiti and the earthquake. They're used in China um, because it provides uh, basically um, all your vitamins, amino acids, and proteins that you need in a glass bowl. It might not taste the best, but at least you have all the nutrients you need. And did you say you're working with some of the early companies trying to commercialize, that are looking to commercialize uh, algae biofuel? So the question was, um, are we interested, are we looking to take this to a commercial scale and are we working with both local and international partners? The answer is yes. Um, as you can imagine, if you can find something that you can test out in the environment here, um, it of course has a high value for no matter where you go. So the, 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 we're in the process of putting together several proposals with both Mazdar's uh, Institute and external partners um, to try to do a small test facility here. So we can actually go outside and show people what this can do under these conditions. And then, you know, for us, we, you know, we're chemical engineers. We build things and, you know, we do process flows, we do all these things. Try to find the best system out of all the ones that are out there for this environment. Because okay? every environment that you're in will have different kind of set of parameters that you have to somehow work with. And can you name the commercial partners that you are working with or not really? Um, can you name the commercial partners? You could probably think about them. <laughs> Large oil companies. Okay. Um, what does it rhyme with? <laughs> two initial, I mean two letters. Okay. No, but you know, Exxon has spent $350 million with Craig Venture in the U.S. Okay. BP has spent $100 million in Europe right now with Wageningen mm -hmm. University and other places um, with their algae parks. Mm -hmm. You know, Wageningen University is very interested in trying to tie into something here in the UAE. Um, they're actually working with Saudi right now 
but they're looking at the Red Sea. They're not looking at terrestrial algae, they're looking at ocean algae. So there's the interest to look at another set of possible sources of biomass. So, you know, there's, there's definitely a lot of international okay, interest from companies, big companies, um, in what's happening here. I am the lead private uh, PI, so principal investigator. This is my laboratory. And um, Ahmed is my student, and I'm the chemical engineer. I'm a professor in the chemical engineering program. Professor Hector, H-E-C-T-O-R. Yeah, Hector Hernandez. Yeah.